This is a reading of Thunder Rolling in the Mountains, chapter 22. For seven suns, I stayed in the teepee of red elk. I was not permitted to go outside unless a lighting dove held the rawhide lead. At night, I was tethered to a teepee pole like a horse. The rifles that Red Elk had taken from us were always before my eyes. He wrapped the barrels in antelope hide and placed them against the wall of the teepee. All day I looked at them, and all day I thought of the treachery that had led to the death of Swan Necklace. At first, I did not know why my life was spared. Red Elk paid no attention to me. He looked through me and never spoke. A lighting dove was kind, but never asked me to work. Yet a captive woman is not, or is not allowed to be idle. I listened to their talk. After a few suns, some of their words had meaning. I did not let them know how many Assiniboine words I had learned. From their talk at night, I discovered that Charging Hawk once had a wife. She had died three snows before. She was big with child, and her baby died with her. For three snows, Charging Hawk had grieved and looked at no other woman even though Red Elk urged him to take a new wife. Now Charging Hawk had plans for me. He found me more pleasing than any of the Assiniboine women. Their words told me why Charging Hawk spent much time in the teepee, something warriors did not do in good weather. He sat on the side making arrows and watching me out of the corner of his eye. If I stared at him, he grinned foolishly. Soon Charging Hawk had, had filled a quiver with arrows, each one as long as his arm to the tips of his fingers. I could tell they were not war arrows because they had narrow blades so that they could be pulled out of the animal's flesh and used again. The arrows meant for battle had short, broad tips with hooks on them, so that they stuck tightly and tore the flesh when pulled. On the seventh sun, Charging Hawk oiled his hair with bear grease and wrapped his braids in otter fur. From his ears hung ornaments of polished metal. He put on his finest clothes. His buckskin shirt was decorated with green porcupine quills. From the shoulder straps hung strands of hair from scalps he had taken. On the back was painted a red hand, the sign that he had killed another warrior in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At his throat was a necklace of enormous bear claws. From my seat beside the fire, I watched Charging Hawk place a fox skin on a pole some distance away. He walked to a clearing on the other side of the teepee. When he was certain, I looked at him. He pulled a handful of arrows from the quiver at his belt. There were many arrows as fingers on his two hands. Quickly, he shot the arrows, his hands moving so fast they blurred. Before the first had hit the fox skin, the last was moving through the air. All the arrows hit the skin in a spot no larger than my hand. Without speaking, Charging Hawk plucked the arrows from the pole and marched off. He had shown me his skill as a marksman. I could be certain that those in his teepee would never want for meat. That night, 
a lighting dove told me that Charging Hawk wished to marry me. She said that I was lucky. Most captive women became slaves. But as the wife of Charging Hawk, I would be an Assiniboine. Charging Hawk was a great warrior and a skillful hunter. But I felt only hatred for him. Now I must become his wife. After that day, a lighting dove gave me work to do, but she always worked beside me. She watched me closely and showed me the Assiniboine way to roast roots and dry meat. She showed me how they stored their dried food for winter. She did many things in the Nimipu way, but some were different. I learned how to cook meat as the Assiniboines did. A lighting dove showed me how to dig a hole in the ground and line it with rawhide. She filled the hole with water and put a big chunk of buffalo meat in it. Into the water she dropped large hot, she dropped large red hot stones from the fire. She kept changing the stones until the water boiled and the meat cooked. Now I knew why her people were called Assiniboines, stone boilers. Suns passed and winter came. The snow lay deep on the ground. A lighting dove helped me make a dress of elk skin. Like my old dress, it was white and a fringe hung from the skirt. But my old dress had long fringe sleeves and beautiful sky blue quills across the shoulder. The new dress had no sleeves. Instead, there was a beaded skin cape that covered the tops of my arms. From beneath the cape hung many ermine tails. The soft fur would keep me warm in the coldest winter in the coldest weather. I also had white leggings and moccasins. As we worked, a lighting dove told me about her son. He was so swift, she said, that he could run down a buffalo without a horse. He was so strong that he could lift a grizzly bear above his head. He was so brave that he did not hide behind rocks or trees in battle but rode up to the enemy and dared them to fire at him. I bowed my head and kept silent. He was also a man without shame, I thought. He had eaten with swan necklace and slept in the same teepee. Yet he killed his guest to get a rifle. When the dress was finished, a light a lighting dove called me to the fire. She motioned for me to sit down. Then she took a bone needle and held it in the flame until it glowed. Swiftly, she grabbed my ear and thrust the needle through it. Through. I screamed with pain and grabbed for my ear. A lighting dove caught my hand. She shook her head and motioned for me to be still. Three bright drops of blood fell on my fingers. A lighting dove placed the grease stick in the hole to keep it open. Then she did the same to the other ear. This time I sat quiet and did not make a sound even when the hot needle went through my ear. With words and signs, a lighting dove told me that all Assiniboines had holes in their ears. When the holes were healed, I could marry Charging Hawk. My ears healed too fast. Several times I picked at the wounds to keep them raw. In spite of all I could do, the redness disappeared and the flesh was smooth. The Assiniboines held a great feast to celebrate the wedding of their chief's son. Fires blazed in the camps, 
drums beat, whistles shrilled, and flutes made soft noises. After the feasting and dancing and singing, Chief Charging Hawk and I would go to a new teepee. The skins that covered it were painted with buffalo and butterflies, kingfishers, and antelope. When I looked at it, I thought of swan necklace, and my heart was sad. My sorrow did not show. I put on my new clothes. From my ears hung bangles of silver and blue stones brought from lands far to the south. A lighting dove said they had cost Charging Hawk three horses. Because I had no parents to exchange gifts with them, Red Elk and a lighting dove stood on either side of me and asked for the Great Spirit's blessing. At my feet, Charging Hawk lay a beautiful ermine blanket as white as snow and as soft as a cloud. No one in the tribe had such a beautiful blanket. This is our marriage blanket, said Charging Hawk. It's beautiful, I said. Through my, though my lips were so stiff, it was hard to form the Assiniboine words. Charging Hawk grasped my hands while Red Elk spoke of the wife's duty to her husband and the husband's duty to his wife. He asked the great spirit to send us many sons. The men nodded and the women smiled. Someone filled a stone pipe with tobacco and passed it around. Each man took a deep breath and handed it to his neighbor. Charging Hawk drew deeply on the pipe and blew out the smoke. Then he got to his feet and began to dance. He sang to the beat of the drum and danced about the circle of seated men. He grasped one of the warriors by hand and pulled him to his feet. Together they danced and sang. One by one, the other men joined them. At last, all the men were dancing and singing. The women clapped their hands. The dancing lasted far into the night. Smoke from the pipes and the fires filled the cold night air. The smoke was so thick that it was hard to see across the circle of dancers. No one paid any attention to me. I waited. When the dancing grew wild and the voices grew loud, I snatched the ermine blanket and crept away from the circle. I crawled through the line of teepees, stopping only to take a rifle and bullets from the teepee of Red Elk. Once I had reached the edge of the village, I got to my feet and ran faster than ever I had ever run before. <laughs>